In this presentation, we will take a look at and practice calculating solvency ratios. Remember, as we consider ratio analysis, we want to be able to group the ratios by category, that making it easier for us to know what those ratios are doing, communicate that to other people, and it's going to be easier for test questions, common test questions, being to group the ratios into categories. We looked at liquidity and efficiency. We're now going to be looking on solvency ratios. Solvency represents a company's long-term financial viability and its ability to cover long-term obligations as opposed to liquidity and efficiency where we, where we were considering the short-term obligations. Is this company going to be able to pay off its short-term obligations, the debts that are going to be within a year? That was the liquidity uh, ratios. Now we're looking at solvency where we're taking the more long-term perspective. Notice that between these two ratios, one way to kind of solve the liquidity problem if you're having issues paying the short term is to put that uh, the obligations more into a long-term. In other words, take out more long-term loans, for example, rather than the, than the short-term loans. That'll help you out in the short-term term. We'll be able to be in business and uh, achieve our short-term obligations, but it will be not good for the long-term, and we'll see that problem within the solvency uh, calculations. When considering solvency, we're often taking into consideration the capital structure or the structure between the liabilities and the equity. So we'll be dealing with equity and liabilities oftentimes when we're considering solvency calculations. And the reason for that is, of course, because the liabilities and equity represent who has claim to the assets. So the equity represents the claim or the net book value of the claim by the owners versus the liability which represents the claim by third parties. So the, so the differentiation between how much of our total assets, in essence, are claimed by third parties versus how much is going to be the net value or claimed by the owners is going to be the, one of the initial components or the, the main components of the solvency type calculations. We then have profitability calculations and ratios and market prospects. We'll be taking a look at those two in future presentations. What's going to be included in solvency ratios will be the debt ratio, the equity ratio, the debt to equity weight ratio, and the times interest earned. So we're going to start off with the debt ratio and the equity ratio. We're going to combine these together because they're going to be easier to see as we combine them in one place. So we can see the relationship between them as we do so. The debt ratio is the total liabilities or the debts, the total liabilities, the debts, divided by the total liabilities and equity. So let's think about that for a second. We're taking total liabilities. It's the debt ratio. The debts on the balance sheet are what we owe. Total liabilities, including both the current and the long term. So we're not breaking out current and long term. We're looking at the total liabilities, comparing that to the bottom line, which is the total liabilities and equity. Remember that the, that the accounting equation is assets equal liabilities and equity. So this number, liabilities and equity, is the same thing as total assets. In other words, we can think of it as what the company basically has, who has claim to those total assets. This ratio given us the percentage that will be liabilities as compared to equity, which would kind of represent the owner. So the equity ratio then is going to be the total equity, the second part of the liabilities and equity, divided by total liabilities and equity. So given these two components, total liabilities and equity is made up of total liabilities and total equity. So therefore, these two ratios uh, will add up to percentages that will add up to 100%. And we're breaking out the percentage of the 100% total liabilities and equity, also representing basically total assets, and saying what portion of that is being attributed to liabilities, third parties, people that we have to owe or obligate that aren't owners of the company versus owners of the company, which represents the equity or the book value in the company total equity. Let's take a look at an example. Here's going to be our data. All we need is the balance sheet in order to do this calculation. We got the assets, liabilities, and equity. And we're going to do this for A and B. These are going to be two sets of data. We can think of them as two different companies. Easiest way to do this is to break out uh, in a vertical type of fashion, we're going to take the total liabilities, the total equity. So we're just taking the, the bottom line, the total liabilities, which is going to be the sum of the current and the long term. We, we don't have the subcategories broken out here. So we're going to calculate this as the 61340 plus the 82800. That's going to be our total liabilities, including the current and long term portion. Then the equity represents represented here by the 170,000 common stock and the 198,600 in retained earnings. That's the total equity. And that's going to, if we add those two up, we get the 512,740. 
So that is our liabilities and equity side of the, of the balance sheet. We have the liabilities and equity is the total bottom line of the balance sheet, the 512, 740, which is equal equivalent to the total assets. Then we're going to do a comparison, a ratio of each of these components compared to the total. And we'll get a 2872 breakout. In other words, we can take each of these components and compare it to the total or the 144140 divided by the total of 512740. And that gives us a 28%. And then on the equity side, we take the 368600 divided by the total 512740, and that's going to give us the 72% about. And of course, those two add up to the 100%. So if you consider this calculation, we're thinking of the total liabilities and equity, which also represent the total assets. And we're saying, who has claim to those? Is it a third party liabilities, debt, or is it the owners, in essence, the book value of the company represented by equity? In this case, we have the 28% represented by the liabilities and the 72% represented by the equity. Let's take a look at B, where we're going to pull this information and we're taking the of the liabilities, the 100300 plus the 107000, and that's going to be the 2073. The equity represented by the common stock of 196000 and the 136750 of retained earnings, the 332750. And then we can do our ratio analysis compared to the total. So obviously the 207,300 plus 332,750 adds up to the 540, uh, uh, 50. And then we can do our ratio compared to the total, which is the 207,300 divided by the total 540050. And that's going to be the 38%. Always have to deal with the, with the decimals. This is unlikely to come out even. And then the second total is going to be the uh, 62 percent about and that breaks that comes out to 100 percent so if we break out again like our total equity or our total assets same kind of thing and say who owns it 38 for the debt liabilities versus the 62 for the equity so obviously and this type of calculation is considered to be better less risky if we have the higher equity so the 72 percent equity here in terms of a looks better than b then we can have the debt to equity ratio, which is going to be similar, similar, but slightly different. We're taking the total liabilities, the debt, dividing that by the total equity. So note what we have here. It's a little bit different. We're not, ta we're not dividing by the total equity and liabilities, the bottom line of the balance sheet. We're, we're dividing by the equity, which you can consider as the book value of the company. Assets minus liabilities equal the equity. So this, in essence, is what the owner has claimed to. And we're taking the debt, the current debt, divided by what, in essence, the owner has claimed to. Let's take a look at an example. We have the debt to equity. We're going to take the total liabilities. So the total liabilities is going to be the top line. And once again, we're going to add up the liabilities. I won't do it again, but it's going to be the 61,340 and the 82,800 total liabilities, both current and long term. And we're going to be comparing that to the total equity. I won't add it up once again, but it's the 170,000 plus the 198. 600 and then we'll divide those two out similar calculation but don't get them uh, quite mixed up because we're comparing once again the total liabilities to the equity not comparing to total liabilities and equity not comparing to the bottom line but comparing the liabilities to the equity and remember the equity can be calculated as or thought of as assets minus liabilities or the 512740 minus the liabilities the 61340 minus the 82800 that's going to give us our uh, equity, which you can think of as kind of like the book value of the company. So we're comparing the liabilities to equity or we're comparing 144140 in this case divided by the 368600. And that's going to be the 39%. So if you think about this ratio, notice that we want the liabilities, of course, to be as low as possible in relation to the equity, which is kind of like the book value of the company. And therefore, we would like this to be lower. And so in this case, A is going to be lower because we want the, the numerator to be as low as possible uh, com in relation or compared to the denominator and compared to the equity. Next, we'll take a look at times interest earned. Times interest earned is going to be the income before interest and taxes divided by the interest expense.
you can see why this would be a common type of ratio for creditors. In other words, if we're going to loan the company money, our goal is to see, well, can they at least pay back the interest? That's what we're trying to say. I mean, if we loan the money, what we're trying to get is rent on the money. Can they at least pay the rent on the money, the interest on the money? To do that, the confusing part of this ratio is that we have to take net income, but net income already has interest expense in it. And what we're trying to do is see how many times over that interest expense could be paid. And therefore, what we want to do is take net income and add back the interest expense that had been deducted from it so that we can calculate that. And we're also going to add back taxes or we're going to take the income before taxes in our calculation because we don't want to be including the, the taxes because taxes kind of confuse things because of the obviously taxes always confuse things. But the taxes are going to be affected by the expense and therefore they're going to kind of throw off our ratio analysis. So we typically remove the taxes which will be affected by the expenses we remove the interest then we consider how many times the interest could be paid over we divide the interest into the net income not including interest and expenses and see how many times we could pay over the interest given the net income or the performance of the company over a certain time period let's take a look at an example got the balance sheet we got the income statement we got some prior year data this is another one where you want to basically visualize how you can set up this table because this top line item includes more than one number. So you kind of want to write that down. You want to log it down. You want to think it through so that if you have to recalculate it, you can go back to your calculators and, and, and run through it. So we're going to start with the net income. So we have the net income number. Note in our case, we have a net income number down here and don't have a subcategory for income before taxes. Many times financial statements will already have a line item that says income before income taxes just because some calculations do have this kind of this kind of problem just because net income does throw off calculations and mess things up uh, or the taxes throw off calculations and mess things up therefore they often have that breakout if we have that then you can just start with income before taxes and not have to add back the taxes if we have a tax expense calculated but no subcategory we can start with net income and then add back both the income tax and the interest income so we're going to say i don't want income tax included in the calculation of net income in other words i want income net income before income taxes and we want to add back the interest expense because we want to we want to take that out at the beginning and then divide in the interest expense to see how many times we could pay it over that'll give us our subcategory so we took the the net income we took out the income tax. We took out the interest expense on the income statement. That's These are the numbers we took out here. And that'll give us our subtotal, which you could call, of course, income before interest and taxes. We have the top line item now. And then we're going to divide that by the interest expense, which, of course, is the same number here. The reason we took it out is because we then want to divide it back in to see how many times we can divide the interest expense into the income before interest and taxes in our case being 22.3 and 13.7 so going through these calculations one more time we got the net income 164508 plus the income tax 14992 plus the 8400 interest expense that gives us the income before interest and taxes to 1879 then we're going to divide that by the interest expense the 8400 we get 22.4 and 13.7. That means that we can pay over the interest expense 22 times uh, with the income before interest and taxes. The higher this number, the better for the creditor because they feel more safe that they're actually going to get the minimum return on their investment, the interest, the rent on the money, the interest on the loan.